Hello everyone and welcome to your Glassner video report for week 5 2023. So we are looking at a bit of a cross section of the derivative markets and the spot markets today. Uh, the reason we're going to look at both of these different markets is they are both really, really important parts of the Bitcoin economy. And within the trading environment, we have the spot demand that's really driven the market since Genesis, because essentially coins moving around the system, and that's what we really visualize when we're looking at on-chain data, um, is essentially the Bitcoin network itself as coins move between holders and over time. But since really 2018, we've seen the emergence of derivative markets and they go through periods of time where they have increasing degrees of importance. Um, and that typically happens around extremes. We see it in ex this example, for example, is uh, short squeezes. So when everybody is leaning on one side, everyone was expecting $10,000 Bitcoin uh, just a couple of months ago. And uh, here we are pushing up above 23,000. So typically speaking, derivatives, when you get this buildup of leverage or there's too many people on one side of the boat, they tend to add fuel to the fire and sometimes even drive the market and it typically sways between a spot driven market and a derivative driven or a leverage driven market over different periods of time so we're going to look at these dynamics and just see how the derivatives and the spot markets really compare to each other over time so um, for January, it has actually been the strongest monthly price performance since October 2021, which if you can remember October 2021, that was the all time high. So this has been fueled by a historic spot demand. We've seen this in the exchange volumes and we'll talk about this today. Um, but we also had a sequence of short squeezes that really gave it that extra fuel um, to really get off the bottom there. So we're going to look at it from both of these different angles. We're going to look at some of the dynamics showing up in the derivative space. And we're also going to look at some of the dynamics in terms of dominance um, when we're looking at spot withdrawals and deposits. Now, what we are going to do for this particular session, normally we go through this in, uh, in dashboard format. Um, we're going to start there. But what I actually want to do is break out a set of these charts and actually look at it in Workbench and Studio. So um, this is a different method. Um, please do let me know if you enjoy this particular approach better when we're looking at things on the big screen with full charts, single charts at a time. Um, dashboards are a really great way to collate ideas, and that's why we use them for our week on chain analysis. Um, but uh, we have had some people asking, hey, can you tell us a little bit more about how things work in Workbench and Studio? Um, so we're going to be doing this on the big screen. Please do let me know your feedback. Let me know if you enjoyed or didn't enjoy this particular type, and we can always adjust as we go. As always, please do give us a share and a subscribe and a like. Um, it does uh, help this channel get to more places. Righto, let's get into it. All right, so let's start with a very, very quick overview. This is the dashboard. Again, you'll always find the dashboard in the description of the video below. Um, here is our January price action, and it has been some of the best price performance since October 2021, and it gets us very close to the top of the range that we've been back in August. So again, we've had a little bit of a, a pullback over the last couple of days, but it really is quite a remarkable rally off the bottom. Um, and as I noted, really the last time we had price performance that was this strong, uh, it was October 2021. Now, for a great majority of the charts and the models that we're going to be looking at today, you will find them underneath our exchanges dashboard. So here on our dashboard tab, um, under Bitcoin, you will find exchanges. This is where you'll find many of the uh, the spot exchanges, um, and this is the, uh, the dashboard of the week. You'll find many of the charts we're about to cover within there. Um, but for now, let's get started and have a look at some derivative action. So this particular model is available in our Workbench preset. So inside the Workbench tool, um, we also have charts, which is our base level metrics, but Workbench, uh, me and my team have been rolling out all sorts of different metrics within um, the dashboard itself. So you'll find all sorts of dashboard, um, uh, different charts in here. We're looking at our total futures liquidations, and I'm going to zoom in on a three month basis here. Um, this one, we're looking at hourly data. Um, and what I've done, you'll see here on our futures short liquidation, I've actually done one minus, and I'm taking a 24 hour sum here. So sum of M3, which is our short liquidations times it by minus one, and that shows it on the negative axis. So we can now see when we've got long liquidations in green, short liquidations going on in red, and then the orange gives us the total USD value of both of those combined. Now, if you can believe it, this green here is showing you that some folks during this most extraordinary price action we've seen since October 2021, um, people still got liquidated on the short side. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable how people managed to do this, but there's always people betting on both sides. But as you can see, we had three very, very clear short squeezes. This was $165 million in a day. This was $100 million in a day, and this was $65 million. So you can see a fairly substantial amount of liquidations going on in the derivative markets. It really squeezed prices higher. 
Um, and really, that was kind of a, a fuel to the fire. We've talked about over recent weeks that real spot flash out, that capitulation phase. Um, that was a big changing of hands that occurred following the FTX disaster. And what we've seen here is that there was a huge portion of the market that was actually offside and expecting Bitcoin to be going lower. And it kind of surprised them and took them, uh, took them by surprise. Now, what we are looking at here is back in charts in studio, and we're sitting here looking at our futures long liquidation dominance. Now, I've put this one on an exponential moving average seven day. Why have I done this? So exponential moving averages, they help you smooth out the noise, but they also give you a bit of a faster signal. They weight what happened yesterday more than what happened the day before and more than what happened the day before that. So if I want to see what's going on on a shorter term time horizon, but I also want to eliminate daily noise, I will often use a seven day exponential moving average. And really just to kind of highlight just how much the market was taken by surprise, you can see this is looking at green is longs are getting liquidated. Red means that shorts are getting liquidated. This down here at 15% means that 85% of all liquidations were shorts or 15% were long. So it's really showing you this, like this is quite significant. And you can see the scale of this. It's actually larger than any of the short squeezes that we saw through pretty much the entirety um, of this market cycle. Um, and it's actually larger than even the long liquidation was during the FTX collapse. So very, very significant, but really shows that there was a lot of traders that were on the wrong side of the boat when this particular rally happened. Now, the other thing we're looking at here, this is the futures estimated leverage ratio. So what we're looking at is of all of the futures open interest, let's just take one exchange, for example, Binance. And if we did want to look at only Binance, you can change the exchange up here. So we're going to select Binance here. All of the patterns are fairly similar, but you can inspect it uh, across multiple exchanges. This is looking at the total futures open interest, the total amount of leverage, and it's comparing it to how many BTC are held on the Binance exchange. So you can, I'm an engineer by background, and what I like to look at this as um, your futures open interest or the leverage, that's the force trying to move the market. You've got people who are betting with margin, adding more and more leverage to the system. That's the disturbing force. And the resisting force is the spot balance or the trading activity, the actual spot markets, because generally speaking, futures markets are trying to target um, the, uh, the index price, which is based on spot. So if the spot market starts to move, generally the futures will follow. Sometimes they front run, but this is how these dynamics tend to work. So the disturbing force is leverage and the resisting force is the spot balance on the exchange. So high values here means that there's a lot of futures open interest relative to the balance and lower values means that there is less leverage relative to the balance, a more stable system. So you can see quite distinctly a fairly substantial downtrend that occurred. Really, it peaked just before FTX blew up, and then we've seen a flush out of leverage. We've actually seen the market deleverage and release some of that leverage from the space. So this downtrend is really showing us that spot markets are more likely to be in control. Spot markets are likely driving what's going on. We do clearly have a bit of a short squeeze that's going on within that framework. These things are always working in tandem. But the fact that we're getting a deleveraging during this whole process, to me, really signifies that there has been a washing out of leverage over time. And bearing in mind that FTX essentially went to zero at this point here, so all of this is actual leverage getting pushed out of the system, hedging positions starting to get closed, speculation starting to close. Um, so overall, showing that this is more likely to be a bit more of a spot-driven rally than it is a futures-driven rally. So now moving along to primarily our spot market. So when we look at spot market, we're looking at things like exchange balances, exchange net flows. This particular model here, we're looking at the balance on exchanges, and you can actually turn on and off any one of these legend items if you wanted to inspect a particular exchange. But really the key insight here is that this downtrend that we've seen in exchange balances really has persisted since March, 2020. March, 2020 was the all time high of exchange balances. And we're now down to about 2.15 million BTC. It's about 11.7% of the circulating supply. And really that gets us back to the level we were at in February, 2018. So it brings our exchange balances all the way back uh, to 2018 levels. So there's been a very, very large outflow of coins over the last three to four years. Um, that's been a mix of coins going into institutional custody, going into um, actual investor wallets. Um, so with 11.7% of, uh, of all coins on the exchanges that we're tracking, that leaves the vast majority of coins held by some other investor. 
So to put that into scale, here we're looking at our exchange deposit and withdrawal volume. Now, this one here is a workbench preset. And you can see we've got one here set up for the BTC denomination, and we also have one set up for USD denomination. Now, you can see that sometimes these bars can be a little bit noisy. And for this particular example, just to clean things up, I'm going to take these two input metrics, M3 and M2, and I'm just going to quickly put a simple moving average onto these. And what you'll see is that visually, we can start to really clear this up. We don't particularly care about the daily noise. We're looking for the bigger picture pattern of what's going on. So what you can see is that during the process of the market rallying, we've seen both an increase in inflows and an increase in outflows, right, relative to just before. So it's showing that exchange activity has picked up somewhat. There's been a bit more liveliness come back into the system. However, let's also put this into scale. What we're looking at here are um, inflows and outflows that are really the same as they were back through 2018, 19, and 2020. So it really doesn't have anywhere near the same kind of momentum and scale as we had during the 2021 bull market, but it is, relatively speaking, an uptick from where we were during that very quiet period of December. It's also potentially reflecting just the market coming back to life after the Christmas break. We spoke about how it was very, very quiet, very low volatility, and this is kind of the market waking back up. But if we actually look at this, note the black curve here. This is the net flow. Let's zoom in on a shorter term basis. Maybe let's go two weeks. And what you can see is note how the net flow is basically collapsed onto a value of zero. What that means is that overall, the same amount of inflows are coming in as outflows. And we talked in last week's video how higher prices are going to motivate somebody to start spending and selling their coins. So we're seeing a neutral basis here. And this is important because the next chart we're going to look at, if you look at the black curve here, see how it dipped down below a value of zero? We had fairly substantial, in fact, they were historic, and we'll look at this in a second, historic outflows from exchanges following FTX. Lots and lots of movement towards self-custody. So when you see this go back to a neutral level, it's kind of saying that that initial impulse of coins flowing out of exchanges is slowing down. So if we jump across to our exchange net position change, you can actually see, I mean, this is the scale of outflows, over 200,000 BTC in a month. A remarkable historic amount of coins flowed out of all exchanges that we track um, following the FTX event. Now, just as a quick note, anytime that you see net position change in, uh, in a Glassnode suite, this is a 30-day change. So whatever value that you're reading from this chart, in this case, it's, it's 200,000. That means that 200, the, the change over the last 30 days has been negative 200,000. 200,000 coins have flowed out over that 30-day period. So it's just taking the difference between where we were 30 days ago and where we are today. So what you can also see, let's again zoom in on, say, a two-year time frame. You can see that we've returned to, it's still outflows, but we're talking about 14,000 BTC per day. It has returned to a much more neutral setting. You can see that things are a little bit more relaxed. We're not seeing all of those coins flooding out. That initial impulse has slowed. We're back to neutral. And if we're looking at this, that after the FTX event, where people are withdrawing, typically speaking, if people are withdrawing after such a catastrophic event, it's pretty unlikely that they're going somewhere else to sell them. Generally speaking, they're going to be withdrawing them and putting them into their wallets um, because at this point in time, this is tracking all those coins outside of exchanges. So when we start to see this slow down, it's potentially signaling. You can see that sometimes prior to these, uh, these sell-off events, you get a bit of a panic. We saw this particularly back here in 2021. This is a really key example. There was also the sell-off in December, which motivated. So these uptrends, quite often, it's the trend of this metric that is more important. Are we seeing an increasing amount of flows? Are we seeing a decreasing amount of outflows? Generally speaking, the trend is much more important, and particularly trend shifts are much more important than the actual absolute value. The absolute value gives us an indication of what's going on, but the trend and the trend change is really what tells you what's going on in terms of that, uh, that behavioral cycle. So what we're looking at here is transaction dominance. So of all of the transactions on the blockchain, how many of them are associated with exchange deposits and withdrawals? We're not looking at transaction volumes here. We're purely looking at the number of transactions. So what's quite interesting, you can see here that our transaction count has jumped quite significantly. So Orange is the all network transaction count, and it's jumped by about 50,000 transactions per day. It's, it's pretty significant. We are seeing a lot more activity going on within the Bitcoin network. 
Now, down the bottom here, the red and the green is showing you in, um, deposits and withdrawal transactions. So how many of these orange transactions up here are related to exchanges? So the gray curve is then looking at the ratio between those, essentially the dominance. If this particular model is saying 40%, then it means that 40% of all transactions were either a deposit or a withdrawal. It's giving you a bit of a gauge on how much of the transaction activity is related to the buying and the selling of coins. And as you can see, during bull markets, we see fairly substantial increases. And actually, you can see that these particular models tend to peak around market peaks because market tops are where there is the most number of people. It is the peak of euphoria. The highest number of people are buying, selling, depositing, withdrawing, sending coins all around the world, going to exchanges. Typically speaking, the dominance of exchange transactions will peak somewhere near the peak. And what you see is a rapid collapse as all of that excitement just washes and floods out of the system. It also gives you that indication that maybe, just maybe, that bear market may well be upon us. So what you can see is that this peak in transaction activity is not responsive to the uh, deposits and withdrawals. This is actually going on in the Bitcoin economy outside exchange activity. So there's something going on out there. Maybe it's the new um, fuss about ordinals and different transaction types that people are moving around, but there is something going on in the Bitcoin economy that's generating transaction activity that is not related to exchanges. And that's, in my view, that's typically a good thing to see. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna look at is some really, really interesting pricing models. So one of the beauties of on-chain analysis is we can look at when coins are flowing in and out of exchanges, and we can thus calculate what is the average acquisition and disposal cost of those coins. So you'll find this one here that we're actually gonna look at three different models. The first one is exchange average price by year. We're gonna look at it by exchange, and then we're gonna look at whales and exchanges. And all three of these you will find on the Bitcoin exchanges dashboard that we talked about at the beginning. So what we're calculating here in the purple across all time, let's look at every single coin that's ever flowed out of an exchange and calculate the average acquisition price. Let's assume that every withdrawal is a buy and let's calculate the acquisition price. You can also do this for deposits. Funnily enough, they actually tend to be very, very similar because as you might've seen in our inflow outflow diagram, it typically is fairly evenly matched in inflows and outflows. So what you can see is that this is the all exchange acquisition price, and it was down near the bottom of our 2018 market. That will become important in the next chart, so just keep that in mind. What I've then done is calculated a withdrawal price starting on the 1st of January 2017 in blue, the 1st of January 2018 up here in green, the 1st of 2019 in light green, 1st of 2020 in yellow, and then 2021 and 2022 in red. So what you can actually do, it depends. I mean, for me personally, this was actually me up here at the, uh, the light green. I bought the absolute tippity top of this market and I rode the whole thing all the way down. So this particular green price has a special place in my heart because it pretty much maps my journey throughout the life of Bitcoin. So let's zoom in on a three-year basis. Um, and what's interesting about this current bear market is look how many different cohorts, the class of 2020 got taken out when Three Arrows Capital uh, blew up. The class of 2019 got taken out through that chop. And then the class of 2018 got taken out as we sold off due to FTX. So you can see here, there's our class of 2023 starting to lift off the bottom. You can see that this recent rally has pushed through the class of 2019. It's pushed through the class of 2018. So those groups are now back into a profit. So really, if people are dollar cost averaging, we're looking at the class of 2020 plus who are still the ones that are underwater on their position. And note that the, uh, the cohort of 2017, the class of 2017 was actually hovering just down below the price. So uh, they were lucky to have avoided the, uh, the chaos that the rest of us did. So we're gonna take that exact same logic, but we're gonna apply it per exchange. So here I'm starting only from the launch of Binance back here in July, 2017. And the reason why I've done this is really Binance is now the largest exchange um, and it became very large very quickly. I've also got Coinbase shown in orange, and then I've got all exchanges shown in, uh, in dark orange. So as you can see, Coinbase and Binance customers all had a very, very similar price level to our class of 2019. And both of these groups have also just returned to a profit. So last week we spoke about cohorts of investors coming back into a profit. 
we can see here that we've also got another model that is really showing when those cohorts are returning back into the green. But remember that all exchanges curve from back in 2018 that caught the bottom down here, that purple, that purple curve. So that one there is tracking a very, very long history. But if we look at all exchanges from 2017 onwards, and the reason I've chosen this one is A, that's when Binance started, but B, when Binance started in that 2017 era, this is what I generally consider the price action that you can see on your screen here. I personally consider this to be modern history. Everything that came up to 2017 is just that little bit too old. We can compare it on some levels, but generally speaking for stuff like this, when we're looking at exchange related activity, derivatives, anything that's very modern, typically speaking, I won't spend too much time looking at 2015 or 2013. It's just a little bit outdated. The network was just a different animal back then. Um, what we're looking at here is kind of the modern history of Bitcoin. But isn't it funny that the all exchanges cost basis was sitting down here at 16,700, which is essentially where the market found its current or as at its local floor where we sit at the moment. So you can see that these psychological cost bases Investors tend to react to these psychological levels at scale. And it, you know, it all happens at an individual level, but when you kind of map this thing out at a large scale across many, many people, it's quite interesting how human beings tend to react and behave. And uh, you know, we do respond to our cost basis. We do respond to the 200 day moving average. There's these psychological events that seem to play out time and time again. So the last one I want to cover are the whale cohort. These are entities that are withdrawing from exchanges and have a combined balance of at least a thousand BTC, um, which uh, you know I wish we all had some of that, but uh, not all of, us, all of us are that lucky. Now I've got three different curves. The first one, the yellow one, is the same one, looking at the uh, start of when Binance launched. I've also got one starting at the very bottom of 2018, and the reason why I've picked these bottoms, by the way. I've got Binance starting back here, I've got 2018 at the very bottom, and I've got March 2020 at the very bottom. The reason why I want to show you this is that this is essentially the most favorable possible price that any whale that entered in the previous cycle could have possibly got. So we're looking at all of the whale withdrawals, and we're mapping out, let's assume that they started buying at the very, very tippity bottom of March 2020, what is their cost basis? And for any of you who have weathered this bear market and you've seen your portfolio go down in value and you've seen your cost bases get smashed through time and time again, just know that you are not alone because here's the 2020 whales and they have a cost basis still to this day up here around 28,800. The whales from 2018 are currently at the resistance level of 23,800 and sitting below that at 18,000 are the whales that started accumulating back when Binance first launched. So if you have seen your portfolio go red and you've seen the market drop down below your, uh, your cost basis, don't be afraid because there are some whales out there who have enormous sums of coins who are in the exact same position. It just goes to show just how brutal a Bitcoin bear market can be. Um, it, you know, it, it's essentially taken out just about everybody's cost basis. But as you can see, we are in the process of returning the class of 2017, then the class of 2018, then the class of 2019, the whales from back here in 2017. We're seeing these cohorts starting to return back to a profit. It's not going to be a straight move. It's going to be difficult sailing, I suspect. Um, but what you're starting to see is some of those investors moving back into a profit. And what that generally does, it just take some of the financial stress away. Um, and generally speaking, you can start to look at the on-chain data and exchange flows to start assessing what are investor behaviors now that they're back in a profit and price is starting to move. Are they responding by actually taking exit liquidity? So thanks for tuning in for that session, folks. Hopefully you found that useful. Please do give me some feedback as to whether you enjoyed the larger scale charts, um, whether just getting that little bit more insight into how Studio works, some of the presets that we've got going in uh, in Workbench, um, also just navigating your way around certain moving averages and certain tools that are available to you. Um, as always, you can always leave a question in the comments below. I'm reading all of them and I'll make sure I get back to you as soon as I can. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Cheers.